Well, as we come to our third lesson in our first course on expository preaching, we're going to look at diagram analysis. We're now beginning the mechanics phase of this process of, of, of sermon preparation, the mechanics of it. And we start with diagram analysis. What diagram analysis is, is a way for you to be able to visually see the text a way for you to be able to visually look at the text in a way that will help you to better interpret it. When you open your Bibles and you read the Bible and you look at the Scriptures, you see it in a, either a verse layout or you see it in a, maybe a paragraph layout if you look at a, a standard version of the Bible. And when you're reading your Bible, that's, that kind of format is good for, for reading. And all Bible translations are formatted in that way to facilitate uh, people to be able to read the Bible. But when you're going to interpret the Bible, when you want to examine the text, be able to understand the text, be able to understand what the text means, it's really better to uh, look at the text in a different way, to visually look at it in a way that will enhance your ability to be able to properly interpret it. And for the epistles, when we look at the epistles, uh, those passages, we call it diagram analysis because it, it, it forces you to be able to look at a passage in such a way that, again, you can better interpret it. So if you look at your notes, uh, I want to define for you what is diagram analysis. So what are we talking about here? It says here it is a way to break down a paragraph or what I call a preaching paragraph or a preaching section in an epistolary genre, in an epistle, to see how all the sentences and phrases relate to each other. It's a way to visually see the passage from which you would be able to better derive what is the subject of the passage. That's that what aspect that we uh, talked about before in, in the previous lecture. Uh, it's the contextual aspect of the passage, the why, and then the detail matters. This is what we call the how. So you have to answer, like I said, three questions when you're going to properly interpret a text. We call it the what, why, how. The subject matter, contextual matter, and detail matters. If you do diagram analysis on a passage, you're going to be in a better position to be able to answer those three questions. Now, diagram analysis is not the only step in the process. There are other steps as we will look at. But it, this is where we begin. This is where we get started. Uh, and so I want to cover this material with you. I want to give you the step-by-step -step procedure of what you need to do to do diagram analysis. So we start with this. If you look on your notes, you'll see where it says procedure. And there's just a simple step-by-step -step process. And as I go through this procedure, we're going to use a passage, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, as an example. And as I go through these steps, these, uh, the, this passage will be presented on the screen for you in the way that it needs to be presented so that you can see how this works. So the first step in the process, when you're going to do diagram analysis, is you first have to identify the, numbers, the number of sentences that exist in that paragraph. Again, the paragraph that you are looking at is either in a verse layout or it's in a paragraph layout, depending on what translation of the Bible that you're using. And sometimes even like if you look at the English Standard Version or uh, even an NIV, there are sometimes uh, versions of the Bible that, uh, based on its format, are put in a verse uh, order. Sometimes they're, they're in verse order, but they're in paragraphs. So when you begin to examine a passage, you got to ask yourself, how many sentences are there? And so if you look at the example in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, you will see that the way I've broken it, broken it down is I'm looking for the period markers. Wherever I see the dot for the period, that is the end of of a sentence. So when I look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, I'm finding 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sentences. I have 6 period markers. 
And so what I want to do is divide those so that visually one sentence is separated from another. Now after I do that, then the next part of this is that I need to divide that sentence, each sentence, into its identifiable phrases within each sentence by placing each one on a separate line. So I'm going to break the sentence into smaller pieces. That's the goal here, is to break the sentence down into smaller manageable units, what I call phrases. Uh, sometimes the phrase could be a series of words. Sometimes it may only be one word. But it's, it's identifiable phrases. So if you look at the first sentence here, you'll see that I have broken it down into four various phrases. And I've kept them in the order in which they appear in the text. So sentence number one, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now what you see here is at the end of the phrase, the end of all things is at hand, we have a colon. And when we have a colon, that tells me that that's, that's a break. So I've kept that statement by itself, that phrase by itself. So I've divided it there. The word therefore, that is, uh, we'll learn what that is in a little while, but the word therefore is separated. And then the, the words be self-controlled and sober-minded, that is a self-contained unit of thought there. The idea of for the sake of your prayers. The word for, F-O-R, is a, is a word that helps me to see that that's a separate phrase. Now, these words are all connected together in a sentence. But what we want to do is begin to divide that sentence into smaller units of thought, smaller units of construction, so that we can begin to work with it, begin to understand the relationships of that sentence and how the words and the phrases relate to each other within that sentence. If we look at sentence number two, above all, we put that on a separate line. And then the next phrase, keep loving one another. That's another phrase that exists. And then the word earnestly. And then the words, since love covers a multitude of sins. So I've divided it down into smaller manageable units with, uh, uh, of each of those sentences. And then the third sentence, show hospitality, then on the next line, to one another, and the next line, without grumbling because these are self-contained units. So we begin with that. We begin with defining or identifying how many sentences are in the paragraph to begin with. And then within each paragraph, what we do is we break each sentence down into smaller sections, smaller units of thought, uh, smaller grammatical units. And so there's, there's, not a, there's kind, of a, it's a kind of a science and an art to it. You'll get the feel for it as you begin to examine verses in the text. You'll begin to get a feel for how you divide those uh, phrases down into smaller units uh, uh, of, of grammatical constructions or phrases, so to speak. Now I'm going to skip sentence number four and sentence number five and six because we're doing the same thing. But you can see those on the screen as well. Sentence number four is a very large sentence. Uh, there's a lot of phrases in that sentence. And you can see that breaking it down or breaking it down into, again, it's more manageable units of thought. And, and then for sentence five and six, the last sentence is just one word. But it does have its own period, so we kept it as a separate sentence. Again, this is the starting place for diagramming, is that you break the sentence down into smaller units of thought and smaller connections. Now, the next step in the process is once you've broken each sentence down into smaller units, then you want to identify which phrase within each sentence. So you've got to take it sentence by sentence. Which phrase within the sentence is, would be the main phrase? And, and I label that MP for main phrase. So when you begin to look at each of those areas, each of those phrases that you've, you've isolated, 
you want to ask yourself which one is the main phrase. And when I look at the sentence number one, for example, I have the four phrases. The end of all things is at hand. The word therefore. Uh, the phrase be self-controlled and sober-minded. And the phrase for the sake of your prayers. Now, how am I going to determine which one of those phrases is the main phrase? Well, the main phrase contains the sentence main verb. That's something that you want to look for. What is the main verb? Now, other phrases may have verbs in them or a verbal idea, an action word. A verb is an action word. But the main phrase has the sentence's main verb in it, and that phrase seems to be able to stand on its own. Uh, it, 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 it seems to grammatically stand on its own. So, for example, when I look at sentence number one, I see the phrase, the end of all things is at hand. Now, that definitely does have a verb in it, the word is, and it can stand on its own. But as we're going to learn, the end of all things is at hand is a unique phrase. And we'll learn that in the next step. For now, I'm just going to label it as a subordinating phrase. If it's not a main phrase, you label it a subordinating phrase, which that's in, I put down SP for that. So I'm going to label it a subordinating phrase, and there's a reason for that. Okay, the next word, therefore. That definitely has no, no verbs in it. There's no verbs in that phrase. So it's, it's definitely a subordinating phrase. The next one, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Now, there's two verbal ideas, self-controlled, sober-minded. Those are verbs. And actually, this is the sentence's main verbs because the next phrase, for the sake of your prayers, does not have any verbs in it. So the third phrase of the four is the main phrase. So I'm going to label that MP, main phrase. And the other phrases I will label as subordinating phrases. Let's look at number two, the sentence number two. Above all, there's the first phrase. Definitely there's no verbs in there, so it's a subordinating phrase. Keep loving one another. Ah, now we have a verbal idea. We have an action idea. And if I look at the other phrases, the word earnestly, that's definitely, there's no verbs in that one. So it's a subordinating phrase. The final one, since love covers a multitude of sins, it's true that the final phrase has the word covers in it. However, it also starts with the word since. And since links back to something else. That word does not stand on its own. So even though that phrase has a verb, that phrase, even though it contains a verbal idea, an action idea, is not a phrase that stands on its own when compared with the other phrases. It's the phrase, keep loving one another, that you want to see here as the main phrase. So the way this works, the way, the way it kind of works, is you've got to take a look at all the phrases. And you've got to begin to ask yourself, okay, which are the subordinating phrases? As I look for the main phrase. And you may say to yourself, that is the main phrase. But as you look at all the other phrases, then you may want to change your mind. And you may want to say, no, no, that one's not the main phrase. This one's the main phrase. If, if it's the main phrase, it's going to have the main verbal ideas in it, the main verbs, the sentence is main verb, and it's going to stand on its own. Now, there are some sentences that have a compound main phrase. And that is where you would have it on two separate lines, but they really connect with each other. And it's, it's what's called a compound main phrase. My plan is, is I'm going to produce more videos. It's going to be down below this list of the procedure. Uh, you're going to look down below at the bottom of the website, and you're going to see some of this web page, and you're going to see more videos, tutorial videos that I'm going to make. And what I'm going to do with those tutorial videos is I'm going to take other passages, other epistle passages, and walk through the step-by-step -step procedure and show you in a video how you create a diagram. 
So we're going to do all those steps together. So there's going to be plenty of examples for you to see. And in some of those examples, you're going to see some sentences that have compound main phrases. So you just want to be aware of that. Right now, what I'm trying to do is give you an overview of the process to help you to see that, that there's a, there's a, there is a step-by-step -step procedure that you need to follow in regards to doing diagram analysis. So you break the, the paragraph into sentences, identify them, break the sentences down into smaller uh, segments, smaller phrases, and then you have to ask yourself, of those phrases, which one is the main phrase and which ones of those are the subordinating phrases? So that's all we're doing so far. So that's step one and step two. Now, step three is a unique step. It's something you want to ask yourself about. It's something that you want to think about before you move to the next step. And, and what you have to do is ask yourself, are there any paragraph transition words in that paragraph? Now, Epistles are broken down into paragraphs. When Paul wrote uh, the, the epistle to the Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians, when he wrote those epistles and other epistles, and, and James wrote his epistles, they wrote in units of thought. They wrote in paragraphs, just as we would write a paragraph, just as if you read a book. It's, it's chapters divided in, and each chapter has paragraphs and so on. So they wrote in these paragraphs. Well, when they wrote paragraphs, they would connect one paragraph to the previous paragraph. So they had these transition words, usually at the beginning of the paragraph, that would connect that paragraph, all of those sentences within that paragraph, back to the previous paragraph. So you have to, you have to think it through. Each paragraph is a series of sentences. And when you're diagramming, you're taking one paragraph and then you're dividing it down into its individual sentences and then each sentence is within the individual phrases. So you're breaking it down into smaller pieces. But when you're examining that paragraph and that series of sentences, you have to ask yourself, is there, does there exist a paragraph transition word? Usually that appears at the beginning of the sentence, uh, of a sentence or near the beginning of a sentence. Uh, for if it's a paragraph transition word, use this at the, also at the beginning of the paragraphs, so that usually would make it appear in the first sentence. And so you want to label that. Now, when I look at sentence number one, when I look at sentence number two, three, four, five, six, I do not see any paragraph transition words. But I do see one at the beginning or near the beginning of sentence number one. And it's the word therefore. That one word, therefore connects what Peter is saying in these verses, verses 7 to 11, with what he had said in the previous paragraph, which would be verses 1 to 6. So this connects one paragraph to another. So what I do is I take the, the, uh, the, the notation SP, I delete that, and I put in a new notation TR. TR is, represents transition uh, paragraph, or it's like a transitional word that exists. I just use the, the expression TR for that. And you'll see that on the screen that I made that change. Now, once you have a transition word, if that transition word is the first word in the sentence and there's nothing before it, then everything's okay. But if you have any words that, that come prior to the transition word, you have to examine that phrase or that sentence or whatever it is. You have to examine it to ask yourself, how does that relate to the transition word? So when I see that statement, the end of all things is at hand. That is a statement that Peter is making. In one sense, it's, it acts like a separate sentence on its own. However, there's a colon there, not a period. So it is connected to the current paragraph and the first sentence of, of verse 7. But it's not a main phrase for sentence number 1. The main phrase for sentence number 1 is be self-controlled and sober-minded. But what is, how is the phrase the end of all things is at hand, how is that functioning? 
It's functioning of what I would call an inference statement. And I label it, I take the SP away from that one, and I label it INFS, inference statement. You say, why am I doing this? It's because I want to ask myself, how do these sentences relate to each other in the paragraph? How do all the words and phrases within each sentence relate to each other? I'm trying to begin a process that would help me to interpret the passage, to know what the passage means. And so I need to properly identify each of the phrases within each sentence. And most of these are main phrases or subordinate phrases, right? You see a lot of MP there. You see a, a lot of the SPs. You see those notations. But you may find that there are uh, transitional words, paragraph transitional words, and inference statements. And this particular example has both. So it's a good example to use to kind of get you to think about those things. Because you need to properly identify each phrase, either a subordinate phrase, main phrase, a transition word, or inference statement. Now, you're not going to have an inference statement unless you have a transitional word. And the inference statements are going to be before that, not after that. So you have to remember that. You're going to have some paragraphs that may only have a transitional word. Uh, and no inference statements. But you can't have an inference statement without a transitional word. Usually, I won't say that's in every case, but usually that's the way it works. But then you may have some paragraphs without any par uh, transitional words and without any inference statements. So that could exist as well. And that's why I'm going to make other examples, show you more examples, so that you can see other examples in, in the scriptures, other epistle passages where those don't exist. And so you'll be acquainted with that. And also in class, we'll do more and more examples uh, as well. So you want to think about that. That's step number three in the process. Now we arrive at step number four in this uh, diagram analysis process. When we get to diagramming analysis step number four, what we're doing now is beginning to ask the question, how do these phrases, main phrases, subordinate phrases, how do they all relate to each other? That's what we're working towards. And this is where you really start seeing the diagram take formation or take shape. This is where you really begin to see uh, the work that you're trying to do here, where it all pays off and where you're able to visually see the passage in such a way that it can better help you to think through what the, uh, the writer of that uh, paragraph, the biblical author, what he's trying to really communicate, what he's trying to say. So in step number four, what we do is we identify all the grammatical relationships that exist among all of those phrases, main and subordinate phrases, and we even consider the transitional words, the inference statements. And what we do is we place the subordinate phrases visually in the location of what it modifies. And that what it modifies could be, it could modify the main phrase or it could modify another subordinating phrase. The reason we use the word subordinating is because grammatically subordinating phrases are subordinate or of, of uh, they help add weight, they, they help add uh, strength, to the main phrase. Think of it like a team. You, you have a team of five people. Usually in your team you have a leader. And the leader sets the tone for the team and the agenda. The team leader is the one that takes the full responsibility for everything. And other members on the team are there to help the team leader as a, as, as a group to get the goals accomplished, to meet the needs of whatever that team was established for in the, pers in the first place. Think of each sentence like a team. Each phrase is like a team functioning together, but one of those phrases rises to the top to become the leader in that sentence, become the main phrase. And so all the subordinate phrases are revolving around that. They help support the main phrase. And so what you want to do is visually show that subordination. Visually show how 
the subordinating phrases relate back to the main phrase. That's what you're trying to do in step number four. So the way this works is the main phrase is placed at the left margin of the paper. You just place it on the left side. And then subordinating phrases are moved over to the right depending on where they need to go, where they need to be placed. And some subordinating words can be visually located above or below what it modifies depending on the word order in the passage. So how does this all work? If you look at the example on the screen, what you see is, let's start with sentence number two. Uh, the sentence where it says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Now we labeled the main phrase as being keep loving one another. So I kept that to the left side of the margin. It's over to the left. The phrase above all earnestly and since love covers a multitude of sins, I'm moving those over to the right to visually show in, a, in terms of location of where they should be placed since they modify, since they're subordinate and they modify another phrase. So the way this reads is Peter in this sentence is expressing the idea that we should be keep, keep loving one another. He's telling the, the, his, his readers, you need to keep loving one another. But he doesn't just say that and that's it. He says some other things. If you look at the sentence, he, he says, above all, above all, keep loving one another. The, the, the phrase above all modifies the main phrase, keep loving one another. So I visually move it over and then I draw an arrow pointing down to it. And I draw the arrow from the phrase above all, I point it to the main verb of that main phrase. It's the verbal idea is what I point it back to. And then the word earnestly. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. So the word earnestly modifies, it's subordinate to the phrase, keep loving one another. And then the final phrase. Since love covers a multitude of sins. He's, he's telling them, keep loving one another. Since it is true that love covers a multitude of sins. So grammatically what you see here and even conceptually what you see is that there are these relationships with the subordinating phrases to the main phrase. And the arrows are pointing from all three phrases back to the main phrase. And you see how uh, these phrases relate back to the main phrase or these subordinating phrases relate back. Look at sentence number three. Here's another easy one to look at and it's very clear. Peter makes another command, show hospitality. So he tells the, his readers, you need to be ones who show hospitality. Well, how do you show hospitality? To one another. So the phrase to one another it modifies the word hospitality. Remember, to one another is a phrase that does not stand by itself. It does not stand by itself. It modifies something else. It modifies the word hospitality. So you have an arrow pointing back up to that. And then the phrase without grumbling. That's another phrase, but it doesn't stand by itself. It modifies, it's a subordinating phrase, and it modifies hospitality as well. So what you see here is how subordinating phrases modify main phrases. That's what you see in these two sentences that we've looked at. Now, take a look at sentence number four. This is that complex sentence, that longer sentence that we were talking about earlier. Take a look how this one looks. The, the main phrase here is the words, use it. Paul's talking about, or Peter's talking about, you received a gift, use that gift. So the phrase, use it, is the main phrase. However, there are a lot of subordinating phrases, as you can see. And all the subordinating phrases are moved to the right. But not every subordinating phrase 
modifies the main phrase. Some subordinating phrases modify another subordinating phrase which links back to a main phrase or maybe to another subordinating phrase. You can see the arrows. What the arrows do is they visually show you the path back to the main phrase. So for example, the phrase, as each has received a gift. That definitely, that phrase definitely modifies the word use it, or that verbal idea, that main phrase. To serve one another. Again, it's a subordinating phrase that modifies the word use, U-S-E. As good stewards of God's varied gift, of God's varied grace. That phrase also looks back, modifies the word use for use it. Now, when you look at the phrase way below, in order that God may be glorified. That is a separate subordinating phrase, and that phrase modifies use. But take a look at some of the others. Peter says, as good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And you see how I've indented those over? Because the phrases, whoever speaks, the phrase, whoever serves, does not modify the main verb. It actually modifies the steward. Whoever is referring to who the stewards are. So I got the arrow pointing back to the word steward. And then whoever speaks. The phrase, as one who speaks oracles of God, that's referring back to the idea of the one who speaks. So you can see how visually, when, you, when you're looking at each of the subordinating phrases, and you have to ask yourself, what does it modify? Not every subordinating phrase modifies uh, a main phrase. Sometimes they may modify another subordinating phrase. And that subordinating phrase may modify another subordinating phrase, which that subordinating phrase goes back to the main phrase. There, there's, it's, it's, it's a path back to the main phrase, but not every subordinating phrase directly modifies a main phrase. So you've got to be aware of that. So this is a very complex sentence, right? It's a very detailed sentence. Sometimes the sentences are very succinct. They're very small. There are not many words. Then sometimes sentences can be longer. So you have to isolate each sentence and then you have to examine sentence by sentence by sentence and be able to uh, visually show these relationships. Now take a look at the first sentence. I saved that one for the last on this point number four, step number four process. Remember we had the inference statement and the transitional word? Now, the phrase, be self-controlled and sober-minded, you say, wait a minute, that's the main phrase. Shouldn't it be to the left? Normally it would. But since this sentence contains a transitional word and an inference statement, that changes the ballgame. Now the main phrase is indented because the inference statement and the transitional word take priority because they link the paragraph, the current paragraph, back to the previous paragraph. So what I'm doing is visually showing that, in a sense, even though be self-controlled and sober-minded is a main phrase within the sentence, it's still subordinate to the transitional word and the inference statement. And so when you have a transitional word and inference statement, you want to visually show that. Now, the phrase, for the sake of your prayers, that is a subordinating phrase. And that phrase, as you will see, modifies the, the main phrase of be self-controlled and sober-minded. Now, you may ask, why do I have it pointed back to the word and, the conjunction and? It's because the two verbs, self-controlled and sober-minded, are connected by the word and. and. So what I want to do is just visually show that really they connect to the whole thing. So I'm, I just made a choice of where to connect the arrow. So as you begin to do diagram, you're going to have a lot of questions. That's the way this works. You're going to have a lot of uh, doubting yourself. Did I do this right? Did I, did I modify this subordinate phrase correctly? And, and again, the more you do this, the easier the, it becomes. It's, it becomes more easy to understand how to go about this process. That's why I'm going to make a, more videos later uh, that will appear at the bottom of the webpage 
uh, more example videos and show you more passages and kind of talk it out with you, talk through uh, the process and show you visually how I'm moving phrases around and, and why I line up one phrase, subordinating phrase, under whatever the other phrase may be that it modifies. So you got to think through this. So you have to isolate each sentence, break each sentence down into its phrases, label the phrases correctly, and then begin to, sentence by sentence, visually show where they appear. Now we move to step number five in the process, the final piece of the puzzle, the final step that we work towards. And what we're going to do now is, now we've broken each sentence down and we've visually uh, showed the relationships of the subordinate phrases to the main phrases. and We've done that sentence by sentence, but now we have to do a final step and we have to connect all the sentences together. Not every sentence is isolated from itself. Remember, it's all within a paragraph. Some sentences, in terms of the concepts that the author is trying to communicate, even though the sentence stands by itself grammatically, conceptually, in the mind of the author, because he's the writer, one sentence is subordinate to another sentence. That can happen. One sentence can be subordinate to another. Or... One sentence can be in parallel with another. So you have to ask yourself, what is the relationship from sentence to sentence? And here's how this works. If you look and see what we've done here, what I've put together here for 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 and 11, you see all, five, or all, all the sentences here, I think six sentences, you see them all visually laid out, but I've moved the sentences over to line up in parallel sentence number one, number two, three, and four. I've lined those up because they are a series of commands. Now, sentence one remains the same. The end of all things is at hand is on the left-hand margin. Therefore, and then you see the the phrase, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers, that all remains the same. But, sentence number two. Remember it was at the left margin of the paper? Well, I moved it over. Why? Because it modifies the word therefore. And what you do is you connect when you're, when you're establishing these conceptual relationships and modifying one sentence to another, well, the way you do it is you place the subordinating sentence in the location of the sentence that it modifies and you draw an arrow from the main phrase of the subordinating sentence to the phrase it directly modifies in the other sentence. So the subordination idea of the sentence, what, where you draw the arrow from is from the main phrase. Because before, there was no arrow to, on the main phrase because the main phrase was at the left side of the margin. But if you take a look at sentence number two and you see where it's placed, it is in direct parallel with the previous main phrase, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, keep loving one another is in parallel with be self-controlled and sober-minded. And then if you look at sentence number three, I moved it over. It's that phrase, show hospitality, is in parallel with the other two sentences or the other two main phrases of the previous sentence. And then sentence number four, the phrase use it, which was a main phrase in that sentence, I moved it over because it's in direct parallel and, and, and all of it links back to the idea of the inference word or the transitional word of therefore, which goes back to the inference statement, the end of all things is at hand. So here's the logic that Peter's using. Based on what he said in verses 1 to 6, he makes a statement. He makes a declaration. The declaration is this. The end of all things is at hand. He wants to make that big idea. He wants to put that out there. He wants everybody who's reading this passage to understand that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, since the end of all things is at hand, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to live. 
Here's how I want you to think. I want you to be self-controlled and sober-minded. I want you to love one another, keep loving one another. I want you to show hospitality to each other. And I want you to use the giftedness that God has given you. Since the end of all things is at hand, he's thinking eschatology. He's thinking that, you know, there, there's going to come a day where it's all over. And in light of that truth, live this way today. So he, he has a series of commands. And after he presents the commands, then he says to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's like a, a little doxology attached to the, to the end of the paragraph. Then he says, amen. So by doing the diagram this way, you begin to visually see how the, the words and the phrases relate to each other, and you visually see it in a way that you will not see it in your printed Bible. Again, your printed Bible is, facilitates reading. For the epistles, diagramming facilitates interpretation. It helps you to better interpret the passage. That's why you go through this process. That's why you take it step by step by step by step. And the more you do this, the more you, you, uh, you take a passage and work this way through it, uh, the better your mind will be focused on what are the main ideas? What is the author really saying? And once you start doing this, it changes how you look at the text. Every time you see a passage, you'll begin to diagram in your head. You, you'll begin to move, okay, that's a phrase, moving it over to the left, over to the right. You'll begin to draw arrows in your mind of how this works. It just kind of changes your perception of things. So diagramming is a part of the process. Now, the way this works in our class is you will be assigned a passage, a passage that you're going to have to preach. And, and the first assignment that you will have to complete is called diagram analysis. You will do a diagram of your passage. And so whatever passage you're given, uh, be it from the uh, book of Ephesians, Philippians, or Colossians, or maybe some other epistle, whatever passage you're assigned, uh, that'll be the passage that you eventually preach. You'll do all your exegetical assignments on that passage, and the first exegetical assignment you'll complete is diagram analysis. So when we come to class together, uh, we'll talk more about diagram analysis. We'll, we'll look at some other passages. I'll, if you've got questions and and we'll, do, uh, we'll take questions, and I'll try to give you examples, more examples, maybe some unique cases of, of how some of the passages could be. Uh, but we'll go through this step-by-step -step procedure, these five steps. We'll follow that procedure every time and work through the process for each passage, no matter in the epistles from Romans to Jude, where it shows up. We'll take it, uh, each passage, each preaching passage, and follow that procedure. So again, there'll be more videos down below uh, on the bottom of the web page, this web page. Uh, you can scan down there. And uh, there's also a tool, an online tool called Bible Arc, B I B L E A R C. Uh, you can Google it, find it. I'm going to introduce that to you in some of these other videos. Bible Arc is a tool that helps you to diagram online. It helps you to lay out the phrases in such a way where you can easily make the arrows. It works better than trying to do this in Microsoft Word or even typing it or writing it on a sheet of paper. Uh, even the, uh, uh, what I did with First Peter, I worked through Bible Arc to create that, to, to draw those arrows and make that work for me. So I'm going to teach you that program, that free program. It's free online, and I'm going to show you how to use it. And the examples that I give you in the tutorial videos will be from Bible Arc. I will use Bible Arc. You'll see me use it on the screen. So again, I'll introduce that to you. So take your passage, once you're assigned your passage, and begin the process of working through these steps and diagramming your passage. Bring your passages to class, and we can discuss those. And we can work through those. I'll give you even some time, hopefully, in class that you can spend some time actually working on it. Uh, so uh, that'll be a good thing. So anyway, hopefully this has been helpful. And we'll begin the process of doing more diagramming. We're going to be doing diagramming uh, for the whole first class. We're going to be, uh, this first course, we're going to be doing a lot more diagramming week by week by week. So anyway, take care, and we'll see you in the next lesson.